So Paul Jackson Jr. is a legendary guitar player, super kind person, and a former teacher of mine from USC who taught with a very encouraging approach. I got to interview him recently and we talk about why he went back into teaching, why he teaches the way he does, how he went from playing with Michael Jackson to his own brand of smooth jazz, and he offers some great advice to guitar players. If you don't already know Paul Jackson Jr., I'm sure it's the case where you might not know his name, but you know his guitar parts. A wonderful talent and person, Here's my interview with Paul Jackson Jr. Like I, it took me by surprise that before I met you, it was like, oh, here's this dude he played with uh, Michael Jackson and all these other people and being like, cool. And then we get in there and you have this uh, like arch top and you're like, so jazz? And I was like, oh, that's a surprise. And then I listened to some of your stuff and I was like, wow, that sounds nothing like. <laughs> nothing like the guy on the record. <laughs> <laughs> how did you, uh, how did you balance that side of yourself how did you which which blossom first did they blossom at the same time uh how do you progress in one and the other well the funny thing was it was actually a return to uh the roots of how i started playing because when i started playing my entire life was lee rittenauer wes montgomery and george benson george benson and earl clue that was my entire life so it was you know how can i play solos how can i do that how can you know that was my entire life Right. And I was started working with Patrice and she said, you know, your playing is, is coming on really good, but your rhythm is a little shaky. Can you start working on your rhythm? And so I kind of said, OK, great. And so I really dove into, you know, rhythm, the Jimmy Nolans with James Brown, the Al McKay's, the Ray Parker Jr.'s, anything that I could find with with rhythm on it. Right. So. It turns out that the, the lion's share of my studio work was playing rhythm guitar. Now, here's an interesting thing. Rhythm is kind of an all encompassing thing, like like the track, you know, the, the jazz thing. OK, primarily what that was, was rhythm. It was kind of jazz rhythm. It's in a different context, but it's about making the track feel good. So, you know, that was really my focus. And then later I realized that I really needed to work on, you know, my soloing and things like that. And so it started a, a deep dive or a return to what I was doing before. And it's like, you know. I started using my my recordings and my writing as vehicles to to improve my playing and always try to challenge myself and keep my ears open, always listening, always trying to get better, always practicing. So it began, you know, it, it kind of took up a never ending or a, a yeah, never ending thing of, you know, how good can I get this? Now, the funny thing is, as a quote unquote studio musician, you got to wear a lot of hats. You know, so when we were doing like American Idol, one day it was country week, one day it was rock week, one day it was whatever, you know, or, you know, sit on the stairs and play solo guitar with with Smokey Robinson, you know, so you wear a lot of hats. And so it really uh, not really a balanced thing. It's just kind of you what you do is you look at what you don't do as well as other things and you attack those first. Okay. If, if that makes any sense. It's like it's like I tell people you'll never be too good of a reader, for instance. Yeah. That's you know, you'll never be too good of a reader. So always practice your sight reading and then, you know, go after. Well, what is it that you don't do well? If you don't play rhythm well, we'll work on that most. If you don't solo well, let's work on that. If your sound sucks, well, let's work on your sound. You know, if your acoustic playing is spotty, let's really work on that. You know, uh, one of the reasons that I always recommend to people is to study classical is because it helps with your sound, it helps with your fingerings, it helps with your left hand strength, and it also helps with just, you know, finger picking, you know. So uh, if you get called to fake a banjo part, you know, you can do it because, oh yeah, I just, you know, bing, dig, 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 I can do that, you know. So uh, to answer your question, which I didn't really do, <laughs> don't laugh at me, Elliot. Um, uh, balance, in terms of balancing it, um, you, um, you just kind of examine what it is that you that you'd like to do. You also consider always think about what it is that you could do better. Right. And, and that's what I always do. It's kind of like, you know, um, I still shed or listen to Pat Martino, you know, um, I still listen. You know, there's other, obviously other people like, you know, Julian Lange, who I love, Kurt Rosenwinkel, you know, a lot of you know new guys. But I'm a geezer. So, you know, I'm stuck in Pat Martino, you know, Earl Clue, George Benson. 
land, you know, True. and if I never get out of there and Mike Stern, you know, and if I, oh, and, uh, and John, uh, John Schofield. So if I never get out of those guys, I'll still be okay, <laughs> you know, right. but I do like, I was listening to some Julian Lange and, and I like the way he skipped strings. Mm. So I'm going to incorporate some of that into my playing. Cause it's like, oh man, I kind of dig that, you know? So there's always something to learn, always something to practice. And then you can challenge yourself. Like, uh, um, I recently bought a lap steel that has benders. <laughs> Okay. So that's going to be my summer project is learning how to play this lap steel with benders, you know, and seeing how good I can get that and working on my banjo and obviously working on, you know, working on my jazz. So you, you always challenge yourself to, to get involved in the things that you don't do as well, the things that you'd like to do, you know, and, uh, so I'm sorry, go ahead. What would you say are the benefits to working on your weaknesses versus the exaggerating your strengths, uh, approach? Mm. because you never know how your career is going to start fair enough um i used to work for this guy who for years for a couple of years thought the only thing i played was was a uh, nylon string guitar <laughs> and that's all he called me for we did a jingle and i was playing nylon string it's like oh he plays nylon string so whenever he called me for work it was always a nylon string and maybe about a year later year and a half later he's like oh you play electric i said yeah you know, so you don't, you never know how things are going to start. I mean, you may get started because somebody likes the way you play chord melodies or because somebody likes the way that you, they like your sound. Like, oh, he's got a really interesting sound, you know, and they only call you to do that. And then like a year later, they find out, wait a minute, you do this. Can Hey, can you play acoustic? Yeah, I could do that. It's like, oh, wow. He does that too. And so you never know how your career is going to start. So if you only focus on your strengths, um, you, you limit yourself, you limit your skill set into what you can actually do. I guess in a studio mindset, that would make sense with the decline of studio work. Would that model still make sense? Now, when you say the decline of studio work, you mean in the traditional sense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it still would, because if you listen to the radio, for one thing, guitars are coming back and somebody's got to do it. Uh, it's not traditional in terms of the fact that, you know, guys have, you know, extensive setups at their house where you can send them a file and they can put guitars on it all day long. Uh, so they're less in-person sessions, but there are still such situations where you have to, you know, uh, put guitars on stuff. So I, I'd say it's still, it's still absolutely true. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then how do you, how did you go from, when did you start leading your own band? When did you start doing the band leader thing? How did you move from backing musician to band leader? That was about, that was about 25, almost 30 years ago. I did a record call. I came to play and it did pretty well. And so I said, well, you know, I got to go out and start doing this. And, um, so I said, I got to, you know, put a band together. And so I got some friends and some folks I knew and, you know, and, and just kind of started little by little, just going out and playing. And it's a trial and error thing. You know, the more you do it, the better you get at it, the more you realize what you, what you can do, what you can't do, what you need to do better. And it's just like any other skill set. You know, you, you go out and, and then your band takes shape. It's like, you know, I mean, I need a much better bass player. It's like, are my drummers fantastic, but he doesn't play well with the keyboard player or that kind of stuff. And so you get, you know, you get into casting and, and, uh, and you find out different things like, oh man, this guy's great in town, but when he gets on the road, he loses his mind. So, you learn, you know, like that there's a lot more than to this whole thing than just playing, you know. And so um, probably about, you know, 25 years ago, really, really started figuring out 25. How old am I? Boy, I'm a geezer. Yeah, about 25 years ago. <laughs> what made you want to start it as opposed to like, and there's so many more responsibilities with being a band leader. What made you want to step into that role? Um, because you don't wear any of these jobs too tightly. Um, and being a musician is like playing chess. It's like, okay, you're here and you did this move and it's like, okay, well, what can I do over there that will maybe supplement this? And so you do some of that and then you realize, wait a minute, while I'm doing this, this is falling off or while I'm doing this, this, and this, this is change directions, you know? And so it gives you another option in terms of a skill set 
and and something to do. You know, uh, I, I've scored television shows. I've written television themes. I've ghost written for movies. Um, I've done live TV. Uh, I, I tease people. I say, you know, I was on the Tonight Show. I was a part of the world's greatest karaoke band, you know, because everything we did was covered. Well, not everything, because we also played with a lot of the guest artists. And then we would also do uh, skits, musical skits. Hmm. So, um, but I, I lovingly call it the world's greatest karaoke band. But, um, you know, so you, you don't know what's going to take off and what's not. And so while right before I left The Tonight Show, I did another record. I did uh, Stories from Stomp and Willie because I said, you know what? I said, this is going to end in, in six months. Uh, I need some other options to do some things. So record came out and then I started pursuing more live gigs and more live things started happening. So uh, it gives you, it's an option, a viable option to, to add another piece to the puzzle, you know, uh, another uh, skill set, if you will, where it's like, okay, if I'm not doing as much of this, maybe I can go do some of that, you know? And then now I, it's cool because now I do some of everything, which is kind of cool, you know? How long until you came back to USC to teach? What made you want to come back into teaching? Well, I had never really taught before. And the thing that made me want to do it was I realized that I've been really blessed with a lot of experience and a lot of inside info hmm. that if I don't share it with somebody, it's basically going to pass with me. And I thought that would be a crime. You know, hmm. it's like just something as silly as the right way to tune up or you know, like we've talked about, and you didn't have a problem with it, but, you know, having presets. So if you're in a show, you hit one button instead of four. And it's funny because that came in handy the other day. We were doing pre-records for the Kennedy Center Honors. And there was a line that I was doubling with the bass player. And the composer at the last minute says, hey, Paul, can you add an overdrive on that line? Sure. So I, I used a, um, a Nova Drive, the programmable drive that TC used to make, which is, by the way, a great pedal. And so I put that in chain on one button on one preset. And so when I was doubling the bass lines, I hit that preset and overdrive came on uh, amp channel chains because I was using the tri-axis. And then when I was playing rhythm, went to another preset. So you learn things like that. You learn, you know, um, you know, why you have to play nylon, you know, um, different things about reading, different things about, you know, uh, retuning the guitar. For instance, if you're trying to play something open, and like I've I've done things where I've tuned the guitar down like a minor third mm -hmm. just because what I was trying to play sounded better that way with open strings than capoing it or, you know, just playing it, you know, the normal way. So, um, you know, like if you're, you know, OK, so this, you know, so you got a C minor nine chord, you know, or sorry. Well, if I tune the guitar down a minor third, I could play like this. You know, so it just, you know, just things like that, opening up different options. Right. And so I felt like there are things that I've been blessed with, that the Lord has blessed me with, to know that the only way that I can get them out is to share them. Like, for instance, when we were going over the music from the Emmys, hmm. you know, well, you know, the fact that I did the Emmys, it's like, hey, you know, okay, well, what, is, what does a chart look like from the Emmys? Yeah. You'd ask me that. The, here's one. <laughs> you know, this is what you may have to read. Um, one of the things we've been going over in lessons lately is some of the book to, uh, to the movie La La Land. Oh, cool. You know, from the movie. And it's like, okay, well, these are the charts. You know, I have them. You know, I, I worked in the movie. So, you know, what does it look like? This is what it looks like, you know. So when you see it, you know, when Elliot Klein goes into a movie date for the first time, he doesn't go, ah, odd bars. Ah, what is this? Ah, what does M M3 mean? Well, it means music three. You look in the right hand corner, it tells you the instrument, tells, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I saw this at school. You know, roll the tape or, you know, put it in record. Right. You know, you see a sound change in the middle. Oh, yeah, we went over that. I just do this preset for this one. Hit this button. I go to another preset. See you. Bye. You know, but so that way you don't freak out you know and you know you you learn what a good guitar sounds like recorded you know you, you listen to yourself coming back you learn what a pocket is you know and <clears throat> how to relate to the drummer and things that you don't necessarily think about 
unless you're exposed to it. So all those kind of things I felt like I, I uh, had to offer. And, yeah. uh, you know, so I wanted to teach. And you also teach with a very specific, like, I'm not going to say overly positive, but I, I would say it's very, very positive, very encouraging um, approach, uh, very opposite to maybe some more people who would be like, uh, here's a challenge you need to overcome or like, you know, almost like a, a, a tougher love kind of approach. You do just love approach. Uh, what made you want to teach or is that is that conscious and what made you want to teach that way? Well, it's probably twofold. Part of it is the fact that I've had people that encouraged me a lot in a variety of ways, but I've had a lot of encouragement. And I figured that life beats you down enough. So when you come in your guitar lesson, you don't want to be beat down even more. The other thing is, there's a scripture in the Bible that said, whatsoever man thinks of himself, that's what he is, whatsoever men think, so is he. So if you come in there feeling like a winner, it's like, man, every time I leave Professor Jackson's office, I feel like a winner. Then you're gonna take that into your practice session. You're gonna take that into your next you know, class. You're gonna take that into your next gig. You know, it's like, you know, I feel, I feel like a winner. I feel like I can do this. Not that I'm a master, because you notice I never use the term master this or that. But you know, I can get really good at this and this is something that I can do. You know, and so that's why I, I try to keep the, the positive approach, you know. Right. And uh, there's no scripture that says whatsoever things are lovely, just pure. If there's any virtue or praise, think on those things. So, you know, the good stuff, you know, try to think on that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, you go to school. It's like, OK, man, I got this. I got this chemistry final. You know, it's like, oh, you know, it's like I don't know the, you know, the, the table of elements, table of elements. And I got to know this and that, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, OK, well, you know what? Why don't you work on that, do your final, and then we'll do your guitar final the following week when you have time to practice. Because what I shouldn't do is put undue pressure on you. Then the other thing, too, is got to remember what we're endeavoring to do. What we're endeavoring to do is is be creative kind of on the spot or, or um, uh, you know, stimulate creativity. And so the less pressure that I can give you guys in terms of I mean, there's pressure in terms of, okay, you know, like you'd come in and say, here, I can't came up with this piece of music. You got 30 minutes to put guitars on it. Here we go. You know, okay, that's a, that's a certain amount of pressure. But that's not something where it's a, there's a wrong answer or it's like, okay, I'm giving you a D if I don't like the guitar parts. No, it's a process and it's part of the process. So there's pressure in the actual exercise, but there's no pressure surrounding it. And I feel, I just felt like that for me, that's, that's the way I like to approach it. Hmm. Yeah, it's very, it's very, uh, it's very heartwarming for sure. Uh, it definitely feels like a coach in your corner as opposed okay, you to, you know like, what, Elliot, you don't study with me anymore. You can't get an A. I can't, you know, there's no <laughs> way I can improve your grades. You know, that ship has sailed. I'm sorry. I can't help you. Um, sorry, kidding. I'm kidding. Folks, I'm kidding. I'm, I, I'm kidding. I, never mind. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, out of curiosity, how, how do you take, a uh, a beginning of you know you started playing listening to mainly jazz then you went to usc um worked on your rhythm or whatever uh, you mentioned patrice said mm. and then um how does that turn into playing funk on some of the most popular records of ever um just really a blessing from the lord i mean it's it's a word of mouth thing i got like i said i had a lot of help from a lot of people give you one example. Ray Parker Jr., who I met when I was about 18, 19 years old, uh, had basically stopped doing sessions to pursue solo work. He had a group called Radio that was selling a gazillion records. And so he had several session accounts for people that he did sessions with. So what he would do is there was another guitar player in his band named Charles Fearing, and he knew me. He'd get a call, he'd send Charles on that call. He'd get another call, he'd send me. And so back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, so that was one way I got started. One of the people that he hooked me up with was a guy by the name of Gene Page, who did, you know, everyone from, you can name it, Barbara Streisand, uh, did Unchained Melody, did, you know, all the Whitney Houston stuff. So what happened was I started working for Gene 
which turned into working for Johnny Mathis and Gladys Knight and, and Whitney Houston and and uh, and uh, Teddy Pendergrass and the list goes on in movies and all kinds of stuff. So and then, you know, you meet other people like I met Tom Scott, another USC alumni, alumnus, alumni, alumnus. Um, alum. Yeah, alum. Thanks. <laughs> OK, who at that time, you know, he was doing the L Express, but he was also scoring movies. So he'd call me for movies, you know, and so. It, it was a word of mouth thing. It was a recommendation thing. And fortunately, uh, people say that success happens when opportunity and preparation collide. And so I think it was a situation where, where the Lord allowed those things to collide at, at a certain time. And so that, that's how it happened. 